Welcome back, everybody. This is another Conversations on NRAs. My name is Joseph Orozco. I'm the co-director of the NRAs Project for Alternative Futures. The, uh, the NRAs Project is a forum for conversations and initiatives that focus on discussions dealing with ending oppression, domination, war, and empire. And we often have conversations with people who are thinking around these themes and trying to develop innovative ways of helping us to develop the radical imagination. Today, a conversation on Dungeons and Dragons and philosophical wisdom. Since 2014, the D&D franchise has seen enormous growth. In fact, 2020 was one of the largest uh, sales years for D&D, for Dungeons and Dragons. A lot of this has been spurred on by the pandemic, of course, many people feeling cooped up and wanting to play and expand their imaginations and develop social time, a lot of it done virtually. D&D became a natural kind of way for people to gather together to start playing. Dungeons and Dragons traditionally had been played as a game where people would come together in a room to imagine different kinds of fantasy worlds together. It was created in 1974, so it's one of the longest uh, uh, existing role-playing games out there. But since the pandemic forced us all to social distance, uh, there has been an expansion and a booming on streaming services, and so people playing virtually. And so D&D has also taken a, a big surge in popularity because of its prominent role in the uh, streaming uh, program Stranger Things, and has given a real big boost to people interested in playing D&D. And if you've seen uh, Stranger Things, you realize that D&D has not always been uh, a popular subject in American pop culture. During the 1980s, there was the satanic scare uh, where many people attributed uh, violent crimes and cult-like behavior to people, young uh, kids who were playing Dungeons and Dragons. But this has sort of shifted away in popular culture now. And so it's become this kind of thing in which people are playing in their homes. Uh, the streaming services for playing Dungeons and Dragons have really taken off. And we're going to see very soon the franchise expanding into motion pictures. And so there's going to be a D&D &D motion picture coming out, I believe, in 2023. So uh, today on Conversations on an Rs, we wanted to explore the idea of Dungeons and Dragons, role-playing games in, uh, uh, in general, and philosophical wisdom. So what's the connection between philosophy, if any, and Dungeons and Dragons? I've invited two guests here who are old colleagues of mine, to, who are both hardcore philosophers. They, their professional work is in philosophy, in academia. But they are also hardcore D&D players, uh, and in some cases, they're much more than just simply hobbyists. They've also started to think about how D&D can teach philosophical thinking and philosophical wisdom. So I want to introduce my, my, my guest for today. Uh, first, let me introduce uh, Dr. Albert Spencer. He is a professor at Portland State University. He's been there since 2007. His main interests and areas of specialization in philosophy are American pragmatism, existentialism, environmental philosophy, and pop culture. My second guest is Dr. Terrence McMullen, who you've seen before on our channel. He came to talk to us about Star Wars and philosophy. So he's back after a couple of years of being away. He's a professor of philosophy at Eastern Washington University. He specializes in the philosophy of race, Latin American thought, and uh, philosophy and pop culture. He also has a specialization in thinking about philosophy for children, which is where connection that we'll make today with Dungeons and Dragons. So welcome, both of you. I'm glad to have you on the program. Thank yeah, you so much for having us. Yeah, couldn't be more excited. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm excited with this, too. Uh, you know, I have to admit, uh, you know, in all the reading that I've seen about the popularity of Dungeons and Dragons in the past, say, four or five years, a lot of this has been spurred on by the pandemic. And, you know, for myself, this has also been true. I started playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons with a group of friends of mine that uh, we started off as a book club originally. And for about a year or so, we were just reading uh, different kinds of novels and books together, and we were having a really great time. And then one of us suggested that we run a D&D &D campaign. 
And some of us have not been playing role-playing games for almost, you know, 40 years. And so uh, it was a little bit of, of, a, of a challenge to get back into it. But once we got into it, we really had a good time. And in fact, the campaign that we ran uh, took us about a year and a half, all virtually online. And of course, you know, there were scheduling difficulties, which is always the problem of, uh, of campaigns. But uh, we really had a good time. And in fact, we're now thinking about moving into other games. We moved from Dungeons and Dragons. Now we're moving. I'm the game master for uh, a campaign in Star Trek, uh, the role-playing game, the old FAFSA, FAFSA game from the 1980s. Uh, and then uh, I think we're moving on to another game in a few uh, weeks after we finish up this campaign. So this is something that we've really uh, uh, gotten into. And, uh, you know, we are old-time gamers. We were all playing when we were, you know, in middle school way back when, and we're literally we're talking some 40 years or so ago. But, you know, when I see now the demographics of people who are playing Dungeons & Dragons, uh, it's all over the place. There's no sort of one age group that seems to be dominating uh, the, the the players ranks uh, any you know you have players all the way from 12 years old all the way to you know 60 70 and according to the data that I've seen uh, you know it's about evenly matched in all of those age groups so a lot of people are playing this on all different kinds of levels um, I wanted to speak to you both about the idea of thinking about how Dungeons and Dragons can connect with the practice of philosophy, because I know that both of you have been involved in this in uh, some pretty extensive ways. So before we begin talking about those kinds of connections, um, I was wondering if for those folks who haven't jumped on this bandwagon yet, if you could give us a, a, a basic kind of description about what's involved with the idea of role-playing games in general, but more specifically, what does it mean to play Dungeons and Dragons? Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, well, one of the best descriptions that I like about Dungeons and Dragons or role-playing games in general uh, actually comes from, a, I believe it's a Vox video, a short video they've got about it. Um, and I can give you the, the, the information later. Um, but really the game comes down to, there's uh, usually a, a game master or dungeon master that describes the scenario that's going on. And then the players, often called player characters as well, you know, have to decide what their characters will do. And then you roll the dice and apply the rules to see what the outcome is. So really in its simplest form, it's just that process of describing, deciding, and then rolling or ruling, if you will, depending on which role you're in. Um, and there's a lot of different, you know, uh, systems and way to play. Some have game masters or dungeon masters some don't i think before we started we were talking about solo role-playing games you can play uh a lot of people are familiar with choose your own adventure novels which was certainly the first some of the first role-playing i did before i even know knew about dungeons and dragons um and that's certainly part of the genre as well uh so that's the simplest explanation but that's part of the beauty of it uh as uh as purse would say out of that triad you can make things infinitely complex, right? Yeah. Uh, the only thing I would add to, I mean, I, I think that was a great uh, uh, definition, Randy. I, the The only simple definition that I have for it is that it is a form of interactive, collaborative storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, the DM has certain responsibilities to kind of frame the world, to describe the situation. Um, but, uh, I, I fell in love with D and D at about the same time I was a big theater nerd. Um, and so I was learning the importance of listening and I, not just speaking when the other person is done, the importance of yes. And, and, uh, it's when you try to DM, it's always trying to, to pick up what the player is putting down. And instead of saying, well, I, I heard you, but no, we're going to go in this direction. But to have everybody, not just the DM, but to have everybody as best they can to build off what other people are saying and doing uh, in those roles that they inhabit, uh, which, which maybe this can be a seed for later. I think that's kind of one of the most natural hooks for using this as a practice to encourage democratic behavior. 
uh, and to build up kind of the, the fellow feeling uh, that, that's so important that I think was frayed in many ways, especially during the pandemic, which is, I think, one of the reasons why people were really hungry for what was kind of baked into role playing uh, as a way of creating community. Yeah, I was reading a, an interview with um, uh, Chris Cox, who's the president of Wizards of the Coast, the sort of uh, corporate entity behind Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, part of what he explained, the popularity and the surge of, of Dungeons and Dragons has to do with that it, it taps into what he calls one of the longest human activities, which is gathering together to tell stories with one another. So the Dungeons and Dragons taps into that, that need that we have to sort of sit around with one another and to uh, imagine living in much different kinds of ways and in different kinds of worlds and getting outside of ourselves and becoming different kinds of people, which of course, you know, sounds very attractive, uh, you know, and was a very kind of attractive thing to do during the pandemic when we're undergoing this global existential threat and we wanted to be able to try to imagine a different kind of place and different kind of world. And so part of what I'm interested in is what do those kinds of skills do for philosophical wisdom, for the building of critical thinking skills, and as you pointed out, civic habits, democratic practices. So uh, I'm excited about getting into this all with you. So so thinking about this idea of, of sitting down together and playing a, a role-playing game like Dungeons & Dragons, the, the setting of Dungeons & Dragons is very particular too. There's all sorts of different kinds of role-playing games. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons is set in a sort of kind of specific fantasy kind of world. Uh, could you explain a little bit about what constitutes the Dungeons & Dragons fantasy world? Mm -hmm. Um, well, it, it, it grew out of um, the tactical wargaming culture uh, in the upper Midwest during the 1970s. And uh, instead of just doing medieval battles, they soon wanted to include Tolkien-esque elements to it, you know, combats with dragons and other things. And so the rule set began to kind of emerge from that. So that's sort of the, the, the vanilla kind of original RPG um, setting, you know, one of sort of classical fantasy, but even really quickly, uh, if you go back and read those old school modules, you see that they were, they were beginning to understand like what they kinds of stories they could tell with this. And you see sci-fi elements popping up. Uh, there's one classic adventure. I don't want to spoil it by giving the name, but, uh, you know, they start off fighting really strange creatures, and it turns out it's actually an alien spaceship that has crashed into the fantasy setting. And so they're figuring that out. Uh, one of my favorites, um, and it was one of the first adventures I ever had, was the Isle of Dread. So it's kind of a, a lost world, you know, with dinosaurs and, and uh, ancient ruins and stuff. So even really early on, they discovered there were a wide range of um, settings that you could really do anything uh, with that. But that's that's sort of the, the classic one that emerged in the sort of conventional one. Although it's grown a lot in the 50 yeah. years now since it was invented. Yeah, and it's uh, uh, like Randy was saying, they had they have these uh, sci-fi-esque or space opera type uh, um, adventures. They also have some uh, coming perilously close to trademark violation is is as old as Dungeons and Dragons itself, and nobody in Dungeons and Dragons plays a hobbit. They can play a halfling though, because Tolkien's estate got very active very quickly. Um, so yeah, not, you know nobody can own dragons and ogres, but apparently uh, they own hobbits. Uh, there was a world called Ravenloft, which was um, an expansion of kind of a Dracula esque. Uh, but it was really kind of based more on like 60s and 70s TV adaptations of Dracula. Um, but uh, I'm, I really, you know, um, uh, we, we can talk about some of the limitations uh, of, of Dungeons and Dragons and the fact that it is, uh, you know, uh, at least in part a, a for profit entity. Um, but I think that they are um, they're moving in the right direction. They literally just released a book about two weeks ago called Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel. Mm -hmm. which was um, an effort to encourage non-Eurocentric stories. Um, all of these, you know, all the, the like, like Randy really 
beautifully summarized how it grew out of tactical war gaming in Wisconsin in the 1970s. Um, it had a very, um, you know, uh, 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 Tolkien-esque European flavor to it. And so Journey Through the Radiant Citadel um, is a group of books that are written by um, authors who are uh, connected to from these cultures that have um, Iranian influences or Mexican influences or Barbadian influences, uh, uh, African influences. Um, and it's, it's really wonderful. I mean, they're still very much in a fantasy world. Um, you're never in Mexico, but you are in San Citlan. And uh, they have, you know, uh, uh, the, the author is from Mexico, uh, a really, really wonderful adventure um, that, I, that I actually just DM'd last week called The Fiend of Hollow Mine, mm -hmm. um, uh, which was written uh, by uh, Mario, uh, Mario uh, Ortegón. Uh, who's from Mexico, and it's just fantastic in that it's, it has an incredibly old-school D&D feel. I don't want to give anything away, but there's a mine, and there's something scary in it, and you got to go find it. Um, but the but the world is is very, very different from the traditional or, or the conventional D&D world. You have uh, you have Los Olvidados, who are these walking skeletons who are wearing rebosos, uh, and you have this strange illness that's infecting everyone, and a, a really cool uh, rebel leader called La Paloma, uh, and you got to help her out. Um, so it's it's wonderful how, even though it's 50 years old, it's it's a game that is very, very much alive, very dynamic, and very responsive to the world that we're in. And, and if I might add, I mean, I think that's one of the crucial issues. I mean, uh, Joseph brought up storytelling, right? And who tells the story matters, right? And so, I mean, yeah, this hobby really did cluster around a certain demographic at a certain time. And, you know, when you hear discussions about gatekeeping in pop culture, you hear about grognards in D&D &D <laughs> who are middle-aged white men with a beard. I'm not, not calling anyone out here, you know, but... Um, and I, I try really hard not to be like that, but, you know, who feel like the game must stay pure to certain roots. But, man, this is the beauty of it. Like, nobody really owns the story. Nobody really owns the, um, uh, the ability to engage in this genre of uh, creative, collaborative storytelling. Um, and so, truthfully, uh, to be a dungeon master or even be a player, it's an inherently, like, ethical thing. You have to be thinking about... What ethics am I encoding in this adventure, you know, by who ends up being the hero, uh, you know, how players resolve it, how the world responds to it, right? Um, and then as a player, right, obviously you've got to make a lot of um, ethical decisions as well. The key one that happens almost in every new campaign is that at some point somebody captures a kobold or a goblin. And the big question is, you know, what are we going to do with the cobalt or the goblin, right? And, I mean, it's not hard to see that, you know, in this game, the way it was originally created, cobalts, goblins, orcs were intended to be disposable others. And, you know, if we want, we can do a deconstruction of, you know, what peoples were being used as inspiration or either consciously or unconsciously uh, for different groups. And so... That's where, you know, ethics is inherent in these games. And players got to decide, you know, do we interrogate them? Do we, you know, kill them? You know, some people get real dark and even consider like torture or something. But I'm, I'm happy to say, and especially when I play Dungeons and Dragons with kids, usually they become some kind of mascot or member of the group. And, you know, uh, Erky Timbers or Meepo or you know, these different uh, NPCs like that end up becoming like part of the game, right? So it's it's always ethical. It's it's unavoidable. Uh, and a lot of traditionalists will say, I just want to play d and I don't want to be confronted by all these ethical issues. I just want to kick down the door, kill things and take their treasure. It's like, well, dude, that's, we can play that game if you want, but that's an ethical choice you're making, you know, and you can't avoid making an ethical choice when it comes to the game you facilitate the content of that game and how players interact in that game. 
Yeah, no, I think that that's a, that's a fascinating kind of um, uh, description. Uh, in the campaign that we were playing just recently, we had these kinds of conversations where, in fact, we would capture like a goblin and try to figure out what do we do with this prisoner now? And given, right, and so for people who don't know about Dungeons and Dragons, when you're creating your character that you role play, you also uh, have to decide their, you know, their alignment, their moral compass. And uh, you can go anywhere from uh, uh, upright, morally speaking, to really chaotically evil. And so we had a mixture of different kinds of characters like that. And it was very interesting to sort of see us role playing what a person would what are the kinds of things that it would go through a person's head when they're thinking about dealing with this kind of non-specific, particularly non-human other? And so those conversations were very fascinating to me as a philosopher. I don't know if they always sort of impact people as they're playing this game, but as a philosopher, I was paying attention to that. Um, but you know, let's step back a little bit. I want to I want to ask because I'm always fascinated about this kind of backstory uh, for people who are interested in this work. Um, so Dungeons and Dragons has been around uh, officially since 1974, Gary Gygax being the, the, the creator of this game. Um, I think I started playing in the early 1980s when I was about 10, 11 years old. I got one of the very first editions and started playing this with friends. And so, uh, you know, I've been playing this for a long time in some way or another. Um, and I know that both of you have uh, uh, been involved in this in some way for a long time. Uh, I was wondering if I could hear from both of you, just how did you get involved in playing Dungeons and Dragons? What were your first experiences with the game? And, you know, what did you enjoy about playing the game when you first started doing it? So if, if you can remember back to your first experiences about that. Terry, why don't oh, we yeah. start with you? Yeah, start. Absolutely. So um, it was my 10th birthday in 1982. And um, my brother, Pete, who real quick is visiting me right now. And my son just DM'd him and my eldest brother a couple nights ago. I'll get back to that in a second. Anyway, so it's 1982. My brother, Pete, got me the famous red box, which was um, an all-in-one set. Uh, the, the very, very first D&D &D sets were literally just three books, three booklets that you buy at a gaming store. And people would look at them and be like, what the heck do I do with this? And they'd say, well, go get a map and go get some minis and go get some dice. So they were very smart and they packaged them all together. So I got the red box set. And um, my, first my first DM was my dad, uh, Ed. And he thought it was really cool. Uh, he was a super smart guy. He just picked it up and, and in like one sitting, just flipped through the whole book. And he's like, oh, yeah, I get this. This sounds fun. Um, I was living at the time in Santurce, Puerto Rico, which is where I was raised. We had a family trip to the Virgin Islands. I remember this really clearly. And it was me and another family, my, my, my best friend, uh, the Carries. And we were in uh, St. Thomas um, on the beach. And my dad started DMing us and we're, we're sitting under some palm trees. And um, this touches really closely on what Randy was saying, like, oh, I want to just kick in the door and kill some stuff. We read the book. We we're like, OK, fight orcs, fight skeletons, level up, get treasure. I got it. Um, my dad sends us on this incredibly intense, philosophically uh, rigorous adventure that years later I found out is based on the man in the iron mask. We found out that there's a pretender to the throne who's going to marry a princess and she doesn't know who she's marrying. And if the wedding goes through, an evil kingdom will control two kingdoms and it'll be the end of everything. We didn't fight a darn thing until like the fourth day. And it was all us just collecting clues and doing role playing. And the final, the final confrontation, we finally get to the castle where the, where the sham marriage is taking place. And we, we are like, the, you can hear the music upstairs and we just have to run up the stairs and say, stop. And we had all this evidence. And it's there to get to the stairs. We buy, go by this room that's chock-a-block filled with gold. And we hadn't gotten a darn gold piece yet. And we were all like, this is, and the whole time we're like whinging at my dad, like, you don't know what you're doing. You're doing it wrong. We see all this gold and we're like, oh, let's just, let's just grab a little. Let's just grab a couple handfuls and then go. It's like, we'll have our cake and eat it too. Let's grab a little gold and then we'll still have time to stop the wedding. 
So we grab the gold and we're shoving it in our in our in our pouch and we run up the stairs and then he says, uh, "You start to bleed out your nose, and you get weak, and the poison that was on the gold kills you." And so the my first campaign was a freaking TPK, total party kill, where we all die as we just fall into the throne room, failing in our quest. I was so mad at my dad. I was so mad at him. I was livid with him for like a couple of days because he didn't do it right because it wasn't the fun kick in the door and all that stuff. Um, but that absolutely lasted with, lasted with me my entire life. And now when I teach D&D to kids, I've learned to try to avoid the TPK because that really was emotionally pretty powerful. Um, but it impressed upon me in literally my first game that this is an excellent vehicle to help people think about their moral reasoning um, in addition to being a super fun game. And so I played for years and years and years with my friends in Santurce. Uh, I played all through high school. I kind of lost the thread in college. And then about five years ago, I'm at a bookstore with my, my, my wife and kids and my son, my then like seven-year-old son comes up to me and he says, dad, what's this? And it's the new, it's the fifth edition player's handbook. And I have this like, this, this like time warp experience of me opening the red box and we buy it and we're sitting on a, on a bench outside the bookstore and he's already a dragonborn sorcerer and we've been completely hooked uh, uh, ever since then. And so my son just DM'd his first campaign or his first adventure two days ago and his players were me, my brother Pete, my brother Ed. So it's kind of like the, my first experience was with my dad. His first experience was with me and my brother. So it's uh, it's also a really fun family multi-generational connection. So that's, that's, that's a, that's the short version of my, my backstory. That's a, um... That's absolutely beautiful, Terry. And my story couldn't be completely, couldn't be any more different. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, you know, because it's a, it's a, it's a tale of you know, uh, underground and subversion, and um, you know, uh, it's a darker tale, I guess. Right. So, good, bad, or ugly, you always remember your first uh, game of Dungeons and Dragons or encounter with it. Uh, and ten does seem to be that magical age. Uh, it does seem that. I mean, there's definitely role-playing games for younger players, but that's 10 to 12 is when, I guess as Piaget would say, you know, the, the brain is ready for this kind of uh, stimulation. But for me, it was uh, the summer of 1988 uh, in Appalachia, in the Bible Belt, uh, at a Little League practice. Uh, and you know, there I was, you know, this just pudgy little kid um, you know, completely unathletic, standing out in the field, supposed to be throwing ball with a couple of guys. And one of them comes up and just starts talking about these stories of playing D&D &D the night before. He was like, yeah, I was a cleric and I built myself this war hammer out in my cabin. And we went into this dungeon and I just started killing all these skeletons that were in the room until finally they overwhelmed me and I was about to die. And then three black dragons appeared in the room and they said, I'll save your life, but you have to swear allegiance to me, to us. And I said, to hell with you and stabbed myself with a dagger and died. And I'm like, what the hell kind of video game is this? What are you talking about? Like, where do I get this? It's like, it's Dungeons and Dragons, dude. You gotta, you gotta get a hold of something, some of this. And like, so for me, it always had that, you know, bit of like, you know, subversiveness and, and, and strange, you know, kind of thing. And obviously I was hooked and I went to my parents. I, I grew up in a very loving and supporting home, but we were conservative fundamentalists. And I said, you know, Hey grandpa, I'd really like to get some Dungeons and Dragons books. <laughs> He's like, no, no, you can't have those. Those are, those are satanic. And, you know, that's almost the worst thing you can do because that sense of forbiddenness about it, right? This was the, the first time my granddad had ever said no uh, to any of my interests or endeavors. So, man, at that point, I was just on a quest, uh, my own quest, saving up my money. And uh, I remember looking for an opportunity and we happened to be uh, on vacation at a Toys R Us in South Carolina. 
And there they were on the bookshelf. And I bought the two coolest looking box sets that I could find. One was the blue book. The other one was, uh, I, I still have the original Forgotten Realms campaign setting. Uh, because the pictures just looked so engaging. I had no idea what books I needed for this. And in fact, I was really confused for a long damn time. Because as Terry says, you're, back then you were supposed to start with the red box. But I had the blue box. And that's for basic D&D. But then I had this Forgotten Realm setting, which really looked cool, which was for AD&D. So it was a lot of like bumbling and trying to figure this out and keeping it secret. And my fundamentalist aunt freaking out when she realized that I had bought these on the trip and everything. Um, but I figured it out. You know, I, I, I found the others. Uh, my best friend at that time had a copy of the Red Box. So we became, you know, really good really good friends and um you know it just continued to be a thing but it was like i said very subversive and underground so i i really find the stranger things show to be quite beloved because uh, i was an og member of the hellfire club you know both uh identifying with the younger kids and eddie munson because i began to also play guitar and grow my hair and <laughs> get into Ozzy Osbourne and all those other things I wasn't supposed to do because if they were anywhere as good as Dungeons and Dragons, I had to have some of that. Yeah, I know. I, I know what you mean on the the uh, Satanic Panic. I was I was at a very conservative Catholic school, mm -hmm. and I got called into the headmaster's office on multiple times to swear that I was not worshiping the devil through my Dungeons and Dragons books, which I just found deeply ignorant because I'm like, come on, that's what my Necronomicon is for, right? <laughs> I mean, um, no, uh, I, I got called, I literally got called in like, now I, you, we see you with the books that have the devil symbol on it. It's like, it's just a game, it's just a game. But um, my mom was not as trusting as the headmaster was. And so one day uh, I was away at a football camp. I remember this really clearly. I was away at a football camp and she went into my room and gathered up all the D&D &D books and put them in the incinerator. Uh, and so first, like, and, you know, it was a, it was a pretty deep habit by that point. So it was a lot of books, a lot of modules, all the original box sets, everything, miniatures, dice, all of it gone. Mm -hmm. um, she has since, this is very important, she has since recanted. And since I, I now tell her with great pride about how much I love playing Dungeons and Dragons with my son and other kids and, and how I get to go on podcasts about it and how I'm going to write about it. And she's like, okay, I officially apologize. I was wrong. You were right. So, so Joan McMullen, big fan of the game now, but, but not, not, not in, a, not in 18, uh, not in 1988. Yeah. Yeah. Just think of all the investment that you have lost, right? How much all that stuff is worth now. <laughs> yeah. I try yeah. not to. I try not to. Yeah. That's a heartbreaking story. No. Well, thank yeah. you both for, for sharing with that. Yeah. Um, I had the, the sort of the, uh, uh, the in-between kind of story. I started with a red box set and um, I took it to school. Uh, and, uh, at the time I was, I think this was now I'm thinking about, this was about the fifth grade for me. And I was in a sort of an experimental kind of hippy dippy class. And my teacher who was, uh, I, uh, she was very much influenced by kind of Dewey and ideas of education was like, what's this? And I was like, well, it's Dungeons and Dragons. And you sort of imagine, you know, role playing together. And she said, well, why don't we all play it? And so my first game in D and D was uh, I was the the dungeon master for my class, and I think we just went through the module or something uh, that came with the the basic rules, and uh, and it was a group of I think about twelve of us or so in the class at various ages from like three to fifth grade, and uh, we just played this game and it was fun. So I, I had an institutionalized experience with the game. Uh, I never saw the satanic panic uh, where I was growing up in New Mexico, but uh, uh, it just sort of like fell out. I think after about middle school and then high school, it just was unfashionable to be a nerd. And there was a lot of persecution of nerds. And there, so it was really hard to uh, maintain the hobby when you're getting threatened and beat up all the time uh, uh, playing it uh, openly. So I think about after about middle school, we stopped playing, though we did continue on with a variety of other things, but D&D &D fell by the wayside until very recently. 
So, um, uh, but the first game I remember was really this kind of exciting sort of thing. Going to school every day was exciting because I knew that we were going to play D and D together. So, you know, um, but I, you know, so, so now I know a little bit about your backstories about how you got into the game and what it's meant to you emotionally, nostalgically. Um, I know that both of you now are involved with Dungeons and Dragons, not only as hobbyists that you like to play uh, role playing games, you know, as a hobby um, for your own, you know, for personal enjoyment, but you are also involved. So we might say professionally with Dungeons and Dragons. So I know that both of you uh, are writing and thinking about Dungeons and Dragons from an academic context, but both of you also are uh, do run various kinds of games. Uh, sort of, I guess we would call them professionally in some kinds of ways, either games for children in camps or uh, as parts of different kinds of uh, uh, formal activities. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you've been become involved in Dungeons and Dragons beyond just sort of the hobbyist standpoint. Randy, I'll start with you. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it... Again, let's go back to what you were saying about storytelling. I mean, there's something so basic and primal about this. And once those doors in your imagination get unlocked, you can't really close them again. And you begin to appreciate the power of it. So, like, you know, how did I become a, a philosophy professor, you know, when I was born into a conservative fundamentalist family in Appalachia, right? And, uh, well, I mean, the powers of my mind and imagination, Right. You know, and so I really do have to credit D&D as one of those things that put me on the path of philosophy. I mean, I was a pretty you know spiritual and devout kid, and I still consider myself a spiritual person. Uh, I've got a few little scars and stuff about that upbringing, but my parents were really good people who were doing what was best for me. And much like Terry's mom, they eventually came around, uh, you know, to to understand. So uh, I ended up converting them. Right. Um, but yeah, I think on some level, you know, my first ethical work was the player's handbook, right? I mean, and you've got, like you mentioned, the alignment chart, you know, with the axes of lawful, neutral, and chaotic, and good, neutral, and evil. And so, you know, you're really starting to think these questions. Well, how would a lawful good person behave? And how are they different from a neutral good person? So I was doing ethical philosophy already. Or I got the gold box, which is the immortal rule set, you know, where your characters progress so far, they become demigods. And it gives us elaborate, like, how do they do that? And then, like, what sphere are they going to be focused in? And questions about the multiverse and dimensions. Man, that's, that's metaphysics and ontology there, right? And then as you play the game, you're constantly doing epistemology. Well, what does my character know? Well, what is what is what does the inscription say? Is it in a language that I can understand? Okay, um, do I have reason to think that this thing is magical? It's always this process, you know, really a lot like twenty questions of somebody asking and someone answering, and to try to uh, you know figure out what's going on. And so there was always this really supportive synergistic thing, you know, between uh, being into D and D doing philosophy. I think a lot of like to be able to run the kind of adventures I wanted to run, I had to be delving into deeper content and understanding like why people would behave a certain way. So you get into psychology. Me and my friends, we started playing the world of darkness, white wolf games like vampire and werewolf when we got into high school. So that's starting to get into darker themes and Jungian shadow work and that kind of stuff. Um, so they always mutually supported each other. And I played in grad school and the, um, you know, uh, the, the techniques, I think we can all agree that we have to use as instructors in our classroom are identical to the skill set. We need to be a dungeon master. Right. So they've always supported each other. But, you know, like you, I kind of kept this interest in the closet because there was real, you know, uh, uh, persecution. Right. Like uh, the whole Eddie Munson character in Stranger Things is based on the West Memphis Three, where three teenagers were arrested for murder on very flimsy evidence because they wore black and had long hair and listened to the wrong kind of music. I mean, those, that 
you know, kind of terrified me back then. So, you know, it's, uh, um, so yeah, for a long time, I kept things separated, but people always want to play these games. And it's so great to be in a time where it's finally cool to play. And rather than feeling resentful, it's like, I am a river to my people. Very happy to like, just share, you know, uh, all this life of experience with people. Uh, yeah. And so real quickly, I play a lot of games with adults, like still the vampire and world of darkness games and uh, do some scholarship exploring those darker themes and understanding it. Um, I, I, I have a game with uh, some fellow philosophers and both of you all are invited if you ever want to drop in and play. Um, and I also uh, for four years have done a summer camp uh, for D&D teaching kiddos how to play. And that's probably the most gratifying thing is all of all. Because they always say, like, man, this is so incredible. This is better than any video game I've ever played. And it's like, welcome, my child, to the world of your <laughs> infinite imagination. It costs nothing and can take you anywhere, you know. And can you say a little bit more about that that camp that you you do? Like what's involved in that and how long have you been working on it? Yeah. Um, well, it kind of grew out of, you know, like like Terry was saying, um, wanting to play this game with my daughter once she had sort of come of age. And I ended up not just playing with her, but a good friend of mine who had, who has three sons. So we kind of played for one summer uh, doing the same adventure uh, you started with uh, Joseph um, lost minds of Fandelver. And uh, we all just became hooked. Um, and so I approached uh my daughter's school to see because they do summer camps and they uh, it's a school actually based on Dewey and pedagogy. So they really like, which is why I, I chose to send her there, uh, really like parent involvement uh, in sort of after school stuff. So I started running the camp there and, uh, you know, it's been great. Um, I don't do anything uh, explicitly pedagogical. I think just teaching them how to play and giving them this tool set to explore uh, is enough, but you know I've seen some of Terry's Facebook posts. He's doing some some really good, cool stuff with his, and it's uh, it's inspiring me. I, I kind of like to always stick with modules. I may be a little reluctant, more reluctant than I should be, to homebrew my own adventures and stuff. I like to kind of play in shared, imagined worlds that other people have created, so that we have these touchstones. And I want to give that to the kids too, but. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm excited to hear how Terry's going to answer this question. Yeah, Terry, I I know that you for a while now also have been doing um, professional adventures, working with children, uh, with explicitly sort of philosophical pedagogy involved. Could you explain a little bit about what that endeavor's been all about? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, I I do a lot of D and D playing, kind of across the board. I play. Um, I, I have just a, a regular, uh, as much as we can, bi-weekly game, mostly with a bunch of academics. Um, it's really funny. I was kind of complaining to my wife the other day. I said, it's like, oh, we get to play D and we get to together to play D and D, but like most of the time we're like complaining about our kids or, or people are talking about what they're going to order for food or they just get distracted. And she goes, oh, you mean it's like a book club? And I was like, oh, God, yeah, that's, that's, that's very accurate. Um, so I, I do that. I, I play at my local comic book shop at uh, through what's called the Adventurers League, um, which is a, a hold over from the old tournament games. And what's really nice about this, and I'd, I'd love to talk about Adventurers League later, um, it is a wonderful democratic ritual because we have it posted. Anybody can show up, show up by noon on Sunday. You can play. We always make sure that we have a table ready. Uh, for new players, uh, if there if, if if we don't have a dungeon master, the experienced players roll off, and if you lose, you DM. Um, and um, we have everything from um, doctors and lawyers to old folks to young folks to um, people experiencing host houselessness, um, and. Everyone sits around the table and everyone shares the resources and everyone shares the books and everybody cooperates. And it is um, a very fun, but honestly, 
out of anything I do in my given week, a truly radical act of uh, democratic community building, because it is where I will tra- I will cross over boundaries of age and class and profession more than anything else I do that pulls me out of my 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 little you know social rut to meet lots of different spokenites. So that's some of that's my fun side uh, as a, as you would say as a professional DM. Um, I, I've done a couple of things. One, I've been developing a game for about four years now, and it's both um, a homebrewed or self-written game. But I also have a supplement system that I'm developing to f- the fifth edition rules of D and D. Um, the, the, what the, one of the most brilliant things that Wizards of the Coast did with fifth edition is they have what's called the OGL Open Game License uh, game set, where as long as you literally attach a page of legalese at the end of the document and abide by certain base rules about not using kind of their core intellectual property, um, and most of it has to do with monsters that are truly only in Dungeons and Dragons like Mind Flayers and Beholders, you can use their rules. You can use the basic mechanics of rolling the d20 and hit points and such like that. Whereas in the first edition, they sick their lawyers on anybody that came anywhere near their IP. The beautiful thing about the OGL license is that it's caused this massive explosion of third-party books. Um, that and which and and it's kind of a virtuous cycle. Also leads to more and more people buying the core D and D rule books. So it was actually, you know, doing right by doing well, or doing well by doing right. Anyway, I use using that OGL license. I have a, a game system or a companion system that I call Mystagogue or Guide of the Soul, where um, then it's designed to teach philosophy through D and D specifically to K through twelve students. Um, I make a few changes to the basics rules. Uh, I get rid of alignment and I invite the player to imagine what it would be like if you were there. So to use philosophical term, no more bad faith, no more. Oh, I have to do this because I'm chaotic evil. So that's just what my character would do. I have to go back to your early conversation. Well, my, my, my character is a lawful evil fascist. So I torture him and I kill him. I wouldn't do that, but that's just what my character does. No, that doesn't actually really engender very much philosophical reflection. What would you do? What would you do if you have this person who was trying to kill you, but they're weaker than you, and now the shoe's on the other foot, and now you found out that they're only attacking you because they thought you were somebody horrible, and actually you, without even knowing it, were implicated in some horrible act. Go. Right? Um, so I have so the adventure part of the game that I've been running at this camp uh, called Satori, which is a, a K through 12 camp that that Eastern Washington University runs in the summer, is I put them inside the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, and uh, which which I have taught for years and years and years uh, uh, through the honors program. I love I love the book, and I and I change it, I modify it to be suitable to a to a younger audience. But the very beginning is Gilgamesh, the god king, appears and says, I need you to, this is how he says it, I need you to end this terrible war. Can you, can each of these groups, can you, can you, can you uh, uh, accomplish a tactical uh, feat that will end the war and save people's lives? And the kids hear that and go, yeah, I'm super down with that. And then I'm, I'm really mean. I tell them ahead of time, you're going to face moral quandaries. Each of the three scenarios, there's a curveball. It's not as Gilgamesh described. And they get there, and in each case, there's an innocent person. And they have to decide if they're going to disobey Gilgamesh or if they're going to try and do it, or are they going to try and have their cake and eat it too? And then finally, when they all succeed in some way, you find out that Gilgamesh um, wants there to be as little loss of life as possible because he wants to enslave people to build his wall. And I don't know if you or your listeners know this, but in one of the, I'm not making this up, in one of the versions of the Gilgamesh story, he's literally a tyrant obsessed about building a wall. Not that that's ever come up again. Um, and yeah, it's really funny where the students were like, this is kind of hitting the nail on the head. I thought this was fantasy you were giving me, buddy. Um, and so it's amazing to see what these these young players, uh, and just like just like Randy said, they love D and D. They they just love the game, and about half of them had never played. Half of them are super hardcore D and D fans, 
Um, and to try and, and I say, you know, you're a team, you're working together. And that's everything from in the game to cooperating to in real life, helping people figure out the rules and helping figure out people, helping, helping your other friends figure out how to play the game. Um, and so it's been, a, it's been a really, really fun uh, uh, and, and fulfilling experience. Real quick, one other professional thing that I've been doing is I'm now uh, the chair of the Department of English and Philosophy here. And we at Eastern have this wonderful literary festival called Get Lit. And it's been going on for 28 years. And so this past, um, what was it, April, when we just had it, um, I, uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the okay of my colleagues in the creative writing program who've been running this, I didn't want to just go in and start shoehorning myself in with their total buy-in. Um, I created a couple panels that we humorously called Get Crit, um, where I brought in uh, a pair of professional dungeon masters and, and writers uh, from the Seattle area to first host a panel on diversity and role playing, and then run a live game that included local authors and local figures as the players. And so I'm hoping, I mean, we're all way too busy as it is, but if I find the time, I really want to start to have more games at Eastern, at my university, to encourage faculty, staff, administration, and students to get to know each other, to break down walls, to actually help create more community at Eastern. And also because I think we need more fun in our lives.